At the time of making this video, it's June 2017, and the UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, has called a snap election in the wake of the UK's decision to leave the European Union. Now, politics, especially with today's landscape, is a touchy subject, and one that many people can find boring. But we can all agree that election statistics are awesome. And what's better than election statistics? Using those statistics to predict elections. So in this video, I want to talk about one of the most successful UK election prediction methods used by Electoral Calculus, a website run by mathematician Martin Baxter. But before we get into the maths, I should explain in brief how UK elections work. When the UK elects a new political party to government, it holds a general election. The party that wins the general election is elected to government, with the leader of that party becoming the Prime Minister of the UK. So how do you win a general election? Well, the UK is split up into 650 areas, called constituencies. In each constituency, a political party may or may not choose to have a candidate run for election in that constituency. On the day of the election, the people who live in that constituency go out and cast their vote for whichever candidate, and hence political party, in a first-past-the-post system. Whichever candidate wins the election in that constituency is chosen to represent the people of that constituency as a member of parliament in the House of Commons in London, and the political party they represent wins that seat. To win a UK general election, a political party must gain more than half of all of the seats, so a minimum of 326. There are certain procedures in place for the event that a party fails to gain more than 326 seats. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. UK elections fall into the common trap of only having a few parties that actually have a realistic chance of winning. The three biggest parties in the UK are the Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats. Now that we've established how UK elections work, how do we predict a winner? Well, a pretty simple predictor are exit polls. These are essentially polls taken from a sample of people about which party they'll vote for. Although they can give you a rough measure of the political outcome, they're not very reliable predictors of the general election because they don't make any predictions about which party will win which seat, which is all that really matters in a UK election. But is there a way we can use exit polls to make a better prediction about the election outcome? This is where Electoral Calculus's strong transition model comes in. It builds upon the site's previous transition model, which is again an improvement of the uniform national swing model. The UNS works essentially on the principle that if a party's vote share changes by a certain amount nationally, as predicted by an opinion poll, then it changes by the same amount in each seat. For example, if the Conservatives have a national vote share of 25% in the last election, and in a particular seat they have a vote share of 30%, we get some polling data that predicts the Conservatives will have a national vote share of 35% in the next election. Then we predict that the new vote share in the seat is 30% plus the difference 35 minus 25%, which gives a new vote share of 40%. To put this more rigorously, we could let A be the predicted vote share for a party I in a seat K. So A is what we really want to be able to predict for the next election. C is the previous vote share for a party I in a seat K. And we let P be the predicted national vote share from polling data for a party I. And let E be the previous national vote share for a party I. When the UNS model works, it has been quite successful at making predictions. But it has two big problems. The predicted vote share, A, is capable of being greater than 100% and less than 0%. The transition model aims to improve on this based on two principles. Firstly, if a party's vote share declines, it declines multiplicatively. So if the vote share goes down by 10% nationally, then the vote share in each seat goes down by 10%. If a party's vote share increases, then it increases additively and in proportion to how much their vote share has increased. This is essentially the statement that voters who defect are distributed amongst other parties in proportion to how much that party's vote share has increased. To see how this model works, we'll set up an example. Say in the previous election, we have the following national vote shares, and we're interested in predicting the outcome of a particular seat with the following vote shares. And finally, we have some polling data for the next election, which predicts new national vote shares. For the sake of example, let's just focus on trying to predict the vote share in the seat for the Conservative Party. First, we need to work out their national vote share gain relative to other parties. Of course, if the party's vote share goes down, their gain is zero. So the gain is the difference between the predicted national vote share and the current vote share divided by the same quantity summed over all the parties. We use the max function to pick out the cases where the party's vote share declines rather than increases. So for the Conservatives, the gain comes out at 0.3%. The expression for a general party I would be this, where we sum over all parties. Next, we need to work out the proportion of voters in a particular seat that have defected to another party. These are called the swing voters. If we look at our example seat, we see that Labour has a vote share of 40%. The polling data predicts a national vote share of 35%, which is down 78% from 45%. So the proportion of voters in the seat that have defected is Labour's vote share, 40%, multiplied by 1 minus 0.78. To find the total swing voters for the seat, we just repeat the process for the Conservatives and the Lib Dems, using the max function to exclude cases where parties' vote share increases. Again, the general expression would be as such. 
Now we're ready to compute the predicted conservative vote share for this seat. We stated that if the vote share goes up, it goes up additively. So for the conservatives, their new vote share in this seat is their old vote share, plus their gain multiplied by the swing voters for this seat, which comes out at 32.7%. If their vote share declined, the new share for this seat would be their current vote share, multiplied by the predicted vote share over the previous vote share. We can write these two expressions out in general, and that's the transition model summarized. The strong transition model builds on this, adding an extra layer of sophistication. But let's quickly set the scene of an example election where Labour has a vote share of 45%, the Conservatives 32%, and the Lib Dems 23%. Let's say we're interested in predicting the outcome of a seat where Labour have a 40% vote share, the Conservatives have 35%, and the Lib Dems have 25%. The STM has two new principles. Firstly, a party's vote share in each seat is split up into two categories, strong and weak voters. In the transition model, it's assumed that when voters defect in a seat, the entire proportion of voters decline, but in the STM, it's assumed that secondly, all of a party's weak voters will defect before any of the strong voters. So how do we split a party's voters into strong and weak voters? We set a threshold, say around 20%. If a party's vote share in a seat exceeds 20%, the remainder of the votes is made up of strong voters. For example, in this seat, the Conservatives have gained 35% of the votes. So 20% is made up of weak voters, and the remaining 15% is made up of strong voters. Likewise, the Lib Dems have 20% weak voters and 5% strong voters, and Labour have 25% strong voters and 20% weak voters. There are two other pieces of information we need to know as well. Firstly, the total national turnout, say it's something like 50 million people. But let's just keep this general and label it T0. We also need to know the turnout in each particular seat, and we could just label this T. Our main goal here is to predict the vote shares in this seat for the next election, so we can make a prediction as to which party is going to win this seat. The first thing we want to do is work out each party's national strong and weak vote shares. Say we want to find Labour's national strong vote share. We multiply the turnout in a particular seat by Labour's vote share in the seat, 40%, minus the weak voter threshold, 20%, all divided by the total voter turnout. And then we just count over all of the seats. The general expression would look like this but we use the max function to weed out the cases where the party has no strong voters in a particular seat. Let's say we find the following strong voter shares for each party, 25%, 20%, and 5%. And then the weak voter shares are 20%, 12%, and 18%. Now we have all our data for the previous election in place. We can gather some polling data. Let's say our polls predict Labour 35%, Conservatives 35%, and Lib Dems 30%. Now we use the fact that all weak voters would defect before any strong voters do. If we look at Labour, we see their national vote share has gone down from 45% to 30%, so we can predict the proportion of weak voters to be 35% minus the 25% of strong voters that have not yet defected. This means a new vote share of 35% splits into 25% strong and 10% weak. We can do the same thing for the Conservatives and the Lib Dems. What we've done now is split each party into two sub-parties, a strong party and a weak party. We then apply the transition model. But rather than applying it just to each party, we apply it to the sub-parties, strong Labour, weak Labour, etc. to predict the outcomes in each seat. We then just recombine the strong and weak votes in each seat to work out which party has won the seat. That's essentially it for explaining the model, so if you want to see some actual predictions, you can skip towards the end of this video. But I'll just go through applying the transition model to one of the sub-parties, say weak Labour. Our aim is to apply the transition model and predict the weak voter share in our example seat. So we first work out the share for weak Labour, which comes out at zero as the weak Labour voters' share is predicted to decrease. Since the vote share decreases, we don't even need to calculate the swing voters. The number of weak voters in the seat is just scaled by one half, giving a weak voter share of 10%. If we wanted to work out Labour's total vote share in the seat, we would just apply the transition model to strong Labour and add that to our prediction for weak Labour. So that's a strong transition model in a nutshell. At the time of making this video, Electoral Calculus predicts a conservative majority by only 74%. Now, the STM isn't the only modern electoral prediction model out there. YouGov have been using a multi-level regression and post-stratification model, which I would argue is actually quite a bit more sophisticated than the STM. YouGov's current prediction is a hung parliament, with the Conservatives falling short by 18 seats, quite different from Electoral Calculus's prediction. This election will certainly be an interesting one for statisticians. In closing, wherever you are in the world, please go out and exercise your democratic right to vote. Otherwise we'll end up with end up one of those orange guys in power again.